All right, today's visitor for the field trip for Unit 6 is uh, Professor Christine Hrenya from the Department of Biological and Chemical Engineering, Chemical and Biological Engineering. One of those, okay, right, (laughs) Uh, here at the University of Colorado. And um, Christine does really cool stuff, including some work on the kinds of granular flows that Professor Hertzberg showed at the end of her video. Um, Christine also works on um, PDE kinds of systems. And she's gonna tell you a little bit about um, how to solve PDEs. Thanks, Liz. Um, Nice to meet you all virtually. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what we'd like to do is start, Liz gave me an idea of what your background has been in this class. And so this first slide we're showing here uh, speaks to that a little bit. And it's talking about how to solve an ODE numerically. And so we know, unlike an analytical solution, when you want to solve an ordinary differential equation, the big challenge is to represent those differential terms um, in another form, an algebraic equation, uh, which you can then solve using either linear or nonlinear algebra techniques. Um, So the first example I have here is fairly straightforward. We have our first order first order ODE um, with temperature that's the capital T as the dependent variable and um, small t as the independent variable. So we just have that first order derivative equals some function of those variables. So recall the first step in solving this numerically would be to discretize the domain with the independent variable. And so that's what we're showing along here. Your initial condition that you'd use to solve this equation would be the value of temperature that you put at t naught. Um, And then you would go ahead and solve sequentially for each of those later times. We're discretizing here, we're showing it with an even grid delta t. So once you discretize the grid, what you do is you take that differential term, that ordinary derivative, and approximate it as an algebraic. And here I'm showing a simple finite difference approximation. So it's basically saying that the temperature you have at the grid point you're solving for equals or minus the temperature at the grid point you know over that difference is approximately what that derivative is. And so when you do this for each grid point, what you get is you are able by plugging this approximation into your original derivative, get essentially a recursive relation which allows you to solve for temperature at any grid point based on the previous grid point. So you start with the initial condition and the values you know there, and then you get the temperature at that first grid point. Then you use the temperature obtained at that first grid point to go ahead and solve for the second grid point, etc. And that's what I've been called and calling forward Euler. Forward Euler is exactly right. That's the fancy name for what I just described. (laughs) So now we're going to extend those ideas to how to solve a PDE numerically. So recall that a PDE differs from an, uh, an ODE in that you have more than one independent variable. So consider an equation, again I'm using capital T as the temperature here because that's ultimately what the application um, I'll be showing you um, is related to. And that temperature can vary not only with time but with space as well. And so we have derivatives on the left hand side here I'm showing um, with the one dependent variable and now I've put in red the new independent variable which will be in the x direction. And just because the people in this class won't have seen that funny D, that's called del. So you pronounce that del capital T, del little t. And that's the kind of derivative that Professor Hertzberg was saying you take that only takes the derivative with respect to that one variable and all the other variables, as she said, kind of get carried along. They get treated as constants. So that's what that funny looking D looks like. Great, and that's um, how you can tell just by the way it's written, the difference between an ODE and a PDE. Because the ODE, if we go back to the previous page, has that regular looking D, the derivative, um, whereas PDEs now have that del representing the partial derivative, um, saying that we have more than one independent variable. So how do we solve a PDE numerically? Just extending exactly what we just talked about with the ODEs. So now when we discretize the domain, again, we're doing it to the independent variable, but now I have another independent variable. So I have to discretize the domain both in time as well as in space. And what that means is when I solve for my dependent variable temperature, I'm going to solve for it at each of these grid points. So different time in a different space location. 
Um, and so I approximate those differential terms in my given PDE in a similar way, except see now that I have two subscripts for that temperature because I'm saying at what time I'm solving the temperature, that's the I or I plus one, and then at what spatial location, that's what I'm representing with the J. So what Liz just said about um, if I take the partial of temperature with respect to time, it means that my X, um, my, where I am in the X domain stays the same. Um, and so that's why it's constant and I have just a J there because I'm not changing the X location, I'm only changing the time location. I'm going between I plus one and I. Um, so similarly, if I go over here to the derivative of temperature with respect to space or the X domain, my I subscript stays the same and I change my J subscript um, between these two terms terms to get the derivative in that spatial direction. And so when I take these two and plug them into my given partial differential equation, I didn't show all those here, but you can see that my partial differential equation turns into a system of algebraic equations. If I plug this one in first here, then I would have turned my PDE into an ODE. Um, and that's what Gene Hertzberg had talked about, turning a PDE into a system of little ODEs. And then when I then plug the second derivative approximation in, that's where I then turn my system of ODEs into a system, and it's a large system, of algebraic equations. How many? Oh. Depends how much you discretize this domain. Mm -hmm. We can typically talk about probably on the order of tens of thousands mm -hmm. so or there's, so. There's one for every grid point? There is. Or one big nasty one for every grid point. There's one big nasty one for every grid point. Right. Exactly. All right, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit now about the application. So we've introduced you to the concept of PDEs. Um, what my one of the aspects or one of the projects my group is working on is, um, as Liz mentioned, we do a lot of work in granular flows or solids flows, and we're applying this knowledge to concentrating solar power plants. Um, so it's a form of renewable energy, and you've probably seen pictures. This is one from Sevilla, Spain, of these um, array of solar plants reflecting the sun's light up into what's known as this power tower. So as you can imagine, it gets very hot up here. And what the key to making a system like this work is to be able to take that heat, transfer it to another part of your plant where you can then make electrical energy from. That's often known as the power block. So the key here is really that heat transfer fluid. You want a heat transfer fluid which can operate at very high radiative temperature um, which can hold heat well, that is also inexpensive. What do we want to do? So candidate, a typical heat transfer fluid that's used in all sorts of plants all over the world is steam. It's good at high temperature, but the challenge is it's not good at storing thermal energy. Um, and there's also a high pressure danger. So it's not really a candidate and hasn't been used in these CSP plants. The state of the art these days is molten salts. The challenge with molten salts is all good, although they're very good at storing that energy, they're unstable at temperatures over 600 degrees C. And if we really want to take advantage of how hot the sun can make this heat transfer fluid, we want to be able to up, uh, operate at temperatures at about a thousand degrees C. What my research group is pursuing uh, together with our collaborators is using solid particles as a heat transfer fluid, which sounds funny because a fluid is a gas or a liquid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we say, well, let's do it with solids. Let's flow these solids and do it. But that's exactly what we're doing. The good thing is if you think of solids like sand, they're widely available, very inexpensive, and inert at those high temperatures like a thousand degrees C that we're interested in. Um, so this is the idea we want to pursue. As you might imagine, it's really expensive to build these sorts of things and just try them out. So what we want to do is develop mm -hmm. the mathematical models first and use that as our kind of virtual experiment to see if we're going to get um, in the high temperature, high efficiency range we want at a cost that's reasonable to actually save money over existing technologies. So that's what we're trying to do. So what do our equations look like? They can actually 
get pretty ugly and <laughs> I'm only showing one of seven partial differential equations that we solve. The important terms that I really want to show you here are independent variables. So our temperature in this solar receiver, so that's at the top of the power tower, can vary in time as well as in all three spatial directions. So this is even more complicated than what we showed on the slide that described solving PDEs numerically in that we not only have two independent variables, we now have four independent variables and those need to be discretized for our numerical solution. So what do we get out of this once we solve it? Well, what we get are, um, I'm showing you a video of the simulation on the left. You see the solid particles moving through this array of hexagons. So this was our first prototype at what that receiver was going to look like up, way up high in the power tower. You can see the system has instabilities. I'm sure you've been talking about flow instabilities. You may not be able to tell as well as from what's on the left, but certainly look if we look at the heat transfer coefficient as a function from angle from the apex, and the angle from the apex is going to start at zero here. This is 60, this is 120, this is 180. So we see we have good heat transfer at the side. It increases as the particles flow down this ramp. That's where we see that heat transfer coefficient increasing. And then it drops to zero. And it drops to zero because we no longer have good contact of mm -hmm. particles with the wall. This is the separatrix, I believe, that you've referred to earlier in the class. And so the pro is we get good heat transfer here, but we're really not getting any good heat transfer along the sides or at the bottom face of these hexagons. Um, so that's something we learned from this first prototype that we were able to use this mathematical model to tell us before we even built this unit. So one of the cons we wanted to build on was improving heat transfer on the sides and bottom of these heat transfer tubes. And I should say um, the sun is going to radiate the inside of these tubes and make them hot. The particles don't see that sun directly. They're just traveling down over these hot tubes and getting hot that way. That's um, how the system works. Um, another con though associated with this design is that there are huge, as you might imagine, temperature gradients where the heat transfer is really good on this top ramp versus down here. That's a materials challenge because materials, generally speaking, don't like really large temperature gradients because there's thermal expansion and contraction along those gradients. So this is something we were trying to address in prototype number two. Would, they get, would the particles of sand get stuck there or would that damage the tubes? It would damage the tubes themselves. Yeah, the, the particles themselves are pretty durable um, and they can under, uh, uh, withstand temperature gradients. Mm -hmm. It's really um, along those tubes okay. that they were concerned about. So that made us look at prototype two, and this is where we are right now in the project. So the hot walls are on the left and right side here. Um, they're the ones that see the sun. And what we've done is we've created mm -hmm. almost upside down V-shaped baffles to redirect the particles so they have fairly constant mm -hmm. contact all along the wall. So you can imagine as particles are falling, they're going to build up right here and along the walls and that's exactly what you see. On um, the movie to your right, what you're seeing is that there is a temperature, well this is actually the local heat transfer coefficient. And so we see there's good heat transfer up near the top and it decreases a bit as we go down, but definitely near the walls. Um, we see something with much less temperature gradient than we have before. We can improve on it by changing um, this baffle angle, et cetera, so we don't have that build up here and have a more uniform temperature down here. And that's what we're working on right now. This is a work in progress, so I can't say that it's all done, but you can see how by using these mathematical models, which are incredibly challenging, challenging to solve, have lots of instabilities, have, um, yeah, are, are just challenging numerically. Mm -hmm. um, but we can answer some questions and advance the research much faster than if we had to build these systems. Mm -hmm. Not only much faster, but at a much less cost. Oh. And that's the bonus. Great. Well, thank you so much for telling us about this and both about your work and about the challenge of solving PDEs. I appreciate it. Thank you.